Hello everyone. Welcome to the SSIS video podcast series on the Erga platform. My name is Srishti Singh and I am a student here at Symbiosis School of International Studies from the batch of 2020-22. And today I am joined with one of our professors, Ms. Mamata Mukherjee. And uh, me and Mamata ma'am will be having a conversation on the subject of international security viewed through a gendered lens. we believe that uh, everybody has different experiences and sometimes uh, the disciplines that we study do not essentially account for the experiences of everybody and this is what makes it significant to view the subject matters through the lens of gender and with that i would like to begin our conversation uh, good morning ma'am thank you so much for joining me in this conversation about this really significant topic So I want to be, uh, start off by asking you the very basic question of how exactly would you explain the concept of international security? Right. Uh, thank you, Shristi, for the question. Uh, at the outset, let me clarify that you know when we talk about international security, which is a very broad concept with many layers, uh, we often forget to you know relate it to national security as well, and uh, you. i think we all know that you know internal threats or a state of unrest in a country uh, does have spillover effects and it directly or indirectly affects its you know neighboring countries and international security at large so you know while the emphasis is on states strengthening borders and almost making them impenetrable uh, which is you know what international security actually the main crux of international security is all about but on the other side you know we have also you know come across uh, past events and even current events with the pandemic how these borders can be very porous so national security we see is invariably linked to international security and it mandates a critical assessment of both you know internal and external security threats and pushes the need for you know national security commitments and even multilateral arrangements for that matter in preventing and mitigating any threats to international peace uh however since your question has mainly pointed at how i understand the concept of international security uh i think it is important for us to you know kind of separate the theoretical vocabulary in the field of international relations which is mainly focused on hard security uh rather than soft security issues to simplify what i mean by hard security and what is the standard uh, meaning of hard security well it mainly refers to you know traditional military priorities of individual states or groups of states and here you will notice that you know there is you know an apparent omission of the soft security angle uh, in the broader discourse of international security and this you see in many ways is very problematic while it's true you know that the dividing lines between hard and soft security is rapidly dissolving uh, more so after the cold war and there is a renewed awareness in the international community about highlighting soft security issues uh, i could give you the example of say environmental security threats there are a lot of deliberations going on on environmental security issues uh, in the last few decades but again if we were to draw you know a comparative on states uh political and economic commitments to traditional security issues versus say non traditional security issues i think we would know for ourselves who the clear winner is so what i'm really trying to say is that you know by effectively identifying security from the traditional lens and making the concept more state centric and limited in a way uh there is a clear diversion you know from understanding how individuals perceive and experience security if we are to really dissect the idea of security and uh, separate it to understand you know how the state defines uh, the idea or the notion of security versus how an individual does you will come across two very contrasting angles uh, i think it is very important to ask the question here that who is security for if you come across you know personal accounts in gray literature you will find that even in a state which offers you know the necessary military and so called security establishments uh, the shared or individual understanding of security is very different uh, the experiences of say insecurity continue to persist and i think you and i will agree that uh, even you know us as women rather you know we have different uh, 
identification of you know what we perceive as security and how you know safe and protected we feel our experiences will, our experiences will rather be very different uh this right here is the catch and uh, this is why i think that a lot will come to perspective if we you know move move away from the orthodox understanding of security and ask ourselves how safe and protected we feel in a state and to really extend this you know individual understanding of ours to a bigger concept of international security and i think when we do that that is when we will encounter some very intriguing uh, perspectives uh, which will give us you know a better nuanced understanding of what international security is all about and who it is really meant for ma'am that was a very well put answer and uh, when you were giving that answer you briefly touched upon individual understanding of security as well as the concept of soft security so that brings me to my next question which is why do we need to approach international security through a gendered lens uh right right shishti you see uh, again you know the problem with the traditional doctrine of security is that uh, it is very masculine in, in its approach uh the masculinization of security if i may call it again uh, stems from many factors uh but a particular one i would really like to focus on is the common myth that you know men are normally at the suffering end uh, during armed conflicts and wars uh while statistically you know we can prove that by showing you know the male participation in, in both the parties to a conflict uh and it cannot be denied that even in the most pronounced uh, UN peacekeeping forces uh the female participation is myopic even then the idea that you know women and other gender minorities remain less affected or even unaffected for that matter is uh, very deceptive uh the fault here lies in the narrative which again is shaped predominantly by male voices and uh, male politics and it misses the essence of what we call human security uh you see in situations of military occupations and armed conflicts uh gendered violence remains a common phenomenon women and other gender minorities are targeted directly and indirectly and it has an immense impact on their social and private lives uh, you will come across you know plethora of you know research studies uh and just to give you one example you know the annual reports that are released by the UN secretary general uh, uh which is on conflict related sexual violence it actually goes on to mention that uh, gender based crimes are often used as tactics of terrorism and war uh you will find such cases you know across continents uh, but more so in you know high concentrations in parts of asia and africa uh you know you could take the prominent example of say the yazidi women in northern iraq and northern syria who have been subject to you know kidnapping and forceful deployments of uh, sexual violence and trafficking uh by the extremist groups in the region uh there are also you know several other instances from you know the former world wars if we were to you know look back in history and uh, even in the post cold war era you know with uh, you know the increasing number of regional conflicts and civil wars uh, you could see you know the increase in gendered crimes particularly in uh, say former soviet states uh countries like yemen rwanda south sudan uh, for that matter uh even till date you know the democratic republic of congo and if we are to look at you know countries closer to home uh we could easily refer to examples such as you know afghanistan sri lanka uh myanmar and uh, of course you know we had to talk of india there are so many examples set in the northern and northeastern parts of india or uh, which again are you know if you look closer these are centers of ethnic or regional strife so women and gender minorities are very much affected by you know threats to security in fact you know uh, the suffering for women and gender minorities it continues to go on even during peace time and long after the conflict is over uh, there is you know clear social and economic divide and then cultural aspects which set certain rules for individuals who identify themselves with a certain gender or sexuality and uh, if you do not prescribe to these rules that are set that are set forth by the society then you are a victim to discrimination and abuse uh this aspect uh, of structural structural exclusion 
or say you know ordinary violence as uh, you know we would normally say it in international relations uh, you know occurs in the form of say domestic violence or uh, degrading practices at the community level and you will see that these degrading practices sometimes are very common even in the most advanced and developed societies uh you know these practices actually keep women gender minorities from accessing basic services uh required to build on their agency uh this starts with something as fundamental as you know say health uh, education and employment and goes on to you know extend uh, to aspects of say freedom of freedom to participate and express in uh, political and social spheres uh however going back to what you know i said about human security i think it is important for us to remember that uh, you know the term human uh when we refer to the term human uh, we normally use it as a substitute for the word woman but that's not the case you know the term human is gender neutral and i think it's very important for us to remember that uh so it refers you know equally to all gender identities and therefore it is you know equally important for us to highlight issues uh of gendered crimes against men and there are quite a few reports of men and boys you know in conflict regions who have uh you know survived very heinous crimes such as rape uh, however of course the frequency of such issues uh, are less you know as compared to you know the amount of times women have been exposed to you know serious gendered crimes uh but again if we do not talk about issues that are you know which involve you know stories of male victimization we are endorsing gender based crimes and it you know also pushes the idea of the supposed male invulnerability and that that actually is a very a very serious issue that you know we fail to address sometimes so yes so uh, getting back to your question uh, the gender aspect of security does become very important uh, but i think it's very important for us to look at it mainly from you know human rights and uh, human security perspective uh, so ma'am i think that was a really interesting answer and i agree with everything that you said mm. and uh, in the answer you briefly touched upon the un peacekeeping forces and that actually brings me to my next question which is that why is it significant to involve women and gender minorities in the process of peacekeeping along with men all right uh shishtin before i move ahead to answer your question let me just say that uh, you don't have to agree, agree with everything that i say in fact uh, disagreements particularly in our field is a good thing because you know it actually gets us to explore very interesting perspectives but yeah getting back to your question uh i think i don't want to answer it in a typical matter of fact way that he yes, has you know the role of women and uh, gender minorities as peace builders is important uh and there is no denying the fact that we need a more inclusive representation at negotiation tables and in leadership roles uh but i'm going to look at it from a very basic problem and solution angle um i think you know since the adoption of the un resolution 1325 uh which is about focusing you know the security discourse from a gender perspective and more over you know about making solid provisions for women's involvement in peacekeeping which is now uh, quite the popular talk among the intellectual circles um i think we must also ask this uh, rather peculiar but pertinent question that is you know what will women and gender minorities gain from you know being involved in this process i mean we are all asking the question that should women be involved and to think of it uh, i think the answer is quite straightforward uh, but i think what i'm curious to know is is there really light at the end of the tunnel uh, the deal is quite simple you see that if you want that is if you want an effective solution uh, to your problem you will try to make inroads to you know the decision making and solution process um and if you rely on a third party to dispense justice for you it is all going to be you know very surface level uh because again your voice is not involved but you will see that you know even in societies where you know women are conditioned culturally and socially you know kind of to uh 
keep away from you know so certain spheres of decision making um uh, there are still women who you know who are taking all of these risks and they're not uh, you know taking the roadblocks uh, very seriously and they are taking you know initiatives to really bring about change even when there is you know a downpour of daunting threats coming from you know the so called patriarchal moral police or extremist groups in some states uh so what i'm trying to say is that you will see a trend where women and gender minorities are effectively you know trying to be a part of this process of expression and decision making uh but there are you know see normative and structural imbalances that uh are not allowing the process to take place in its entirety while we you know come to read of women and transgender you know say activist groups playing an active role uh, in bringing about change we also come to read about how some of these groups have suffered backlash and are consciously you know kept away from being involved in uh, peacekeeping initiatives let me give you you know a recent example from this year actually early january this year of the coordinated attacks uh, on women reporters in afghanistan by an extremist group uh, now you see these journalists were assassinated for two reasons first because they were women and employed and second uh, because they worked in a field where they could voice their opinions uh, you will come across you know interesting examples of women protecting their communities uh, even say in india you know i could give you the example of the myra paibi group uh, which is a mothers group from manipur so myra paibi if i am to translate it it basically means women torch bearers and uh, you know this mothers group is active is actively involved in uh, advocating for peace in the region since you know the insurgency but you know still there are some anecdotal references where the women have uh, gone on to state that their contribution you know uh, as peace builders is not appropriately acknowledged even within their households uh, so men within the household do not really recognize their efforts uh, so you know so kind of recognizing uh, their efforts uh, in you know government peace making negotiation tables becomes much more difficult so we need to you know we need to focus on a starting point which is to make structural changes in systems and institutions that uh, directly or indirectly affect both men and women um and over here and over here we're talking about say faith based organizations schools and institutions of education and it is essential that we first address the process of structural exclusion uh, and we could do this through multi stakeholder partnerships and uh, this is again where the role of civil society becomes very important and uh, uh the role of civil society here you know the reason why i'm actually focusing on civil society is because it does not just become important for building the capacity of women and gender minorities but in also creating you know systems which are tuned uh better to adopting and you know uh creating systems which are more inclusive uh where you know initiatives of peace building can actually hold ground i think uh, there was a really good answer and i it's definitely true that everybody needs to have their voice in peace keeping so uh i would like to move on to the next question which is that is there a need for cultural rel- relativism when it comes to gendered international security okay um and now the thing with cultural relativism and uh, universalism is that uh, it has occupied you know a space of controversy for a very long time you see when we talk of cultural relativism uh, we basically referring to certain meanings that are attached to norms and practices uh, that are prevalent in a society i mean if we analyze the understanding of what it means to be masculine and feminine across cultures uh you will observe substantial differences in the understanding of what you know each one stands for now the problem is who decides and checks on what can be acceptable and considered progressive while what could be considered regressive while of course you know the grounds of universalism uh is mostly criticized by uh, cultural relativists on the virtue of it being adopted you know from western philosophy 
But again, you know, this so-called Western or liberal philosophy, which is often construed as fashionably dictating what is best for the developing world. Uh, so, you know, that is, you know, one of the main criticisms by cultural relativists. But, you know, there needs to be some kind of an arrangement where there is universal application for some basic human rights. And gender sensitive principles should, you know, fall under this basic human rights framework. So to legitimize and uh, institutionalize certain gendered norms, a standard universal set of principles will be more helpful, I feel, in creating, you know, a sort of normative global pressure in which individual states cannot simply choose to abstain uh, from their commitment to a gendered approach in security and uh, policy formulation. So yes, I, I do feel that we need to adopt a more universal approach uh, if we are to look at you know, the inclusion of uh, gender and security and to ad adopt a very gender and I mean a very gendered approach uh, in understanding you know, soft security issues. Uh, that was a really interesting answer, ma'am. And with that, I would now like to come to the final question. So uh, while answering my questions, uh, you did br briefly touch upon India, but I would like to know from you more in depth what do you think about uh, India in terms of uh, a gendered international security? Like, How do you think India is doing in this regard? Right. Um, I feel uh, gender is still not accorded the weight it deserves in policy decisions, uh, not just in India, but in most countries. Uh, if you had to mainly talk of India, you know, there are constitutional mechanisms and welfare policies uh, that accord equal gender rights and freedoms. Uh, but in the security discourse, the meaning and scope of uh, gender policy uh, needs to be well-defined for its proper implementation and monitoring. Uh, there is also, you know, the need at policy level to identify new security threats, such as, you know, say, environmental issues, uh, violent extremism, cyber security, uh, to name a few. And uh, to really, you know, map how these uh, security threats affect uh, women and gender minorities and uh, try to call out uh, policy level solutions to these problems. So what could be ideal for India would be, uh, you know, adopt a coherent gender policy approach. And there are examples, you know, of some countries uh, such as Sweden, uh, for example, uh, which has adopted, you know, a feminized uh, foreign policy approach. Uh, even France and Canada, for that matter, have uh, recently adopted a policy approach uh, between the years 2017 and 19, uh, which actually targets, you know, goals of gender equality. In fact, uh, France, you know, recognized the situation of women and girls in conflict uh, areas and uh, announced its commitment to pursuing a feminist diplomacy. And here, you know, while we're referring to feminist diplomacy, uh, it's mainly looking at uh, increasing the number of women in management and ambassador positions. Uh, you know, however, the disturbing part is that uh, there are still less than 10 countries that have proved their commitment to a gendered strategy. So, Going forward, we need to focus on increasing women and gender minorities' participation in leadership roles and decision-making bodies. Uh, that is very crucial. And uh, governments must uh, over here also navigate the prospect of working with you know, women activists and civil society groups uh, in developing you know, gender-balanced peace proposals, which uh, could be a better way ahead in you know, conflict prevention and reconciliation. Oh, we have several examples of female, you know, grassroots movements uh, and activism in India. Uh, I could give you an example of, say, you know, back in the 1970s, 1973, you know, the leadership of Gora Devi uh, in the small village of Reni in Uttarakhand, uh, who led, you know, the Chipko movement, which is actually looked at as a very classic example of women participating in an issue of environmental security. Or you also have the example of Meeda Bakkar, uh, who led the Narmada Bachao Andolan, which worked on development-related issues and human rights. Uh, 
again, if we are to look at, you know, recent examples, I could, you know, state one from this year, which is of the farmers' protests, where almost 50,000, you know, women farmers joined their male counterparts and participated in the protests. Yet, you know, the irony of the situation is that the contribution of women in farming is not acknowledged and uh, almost invisibilized to the extent that uh, farming again becomes some kind of a masculine industry and masculine problem. So what we need to do is recognize and kind of validate these events of activism at the informal level and uh, bring them you know, to the formal negotiation process. We do need to you know, adopt a blended approach whereby we focus on grassroots institutions and agencies of governance to really work together and uh, bring about a substantive change in uh, you know, a culturally and socially diverse country like ours. I think that is a better way ahead. Um, on a side note, uh, you know, just to mention briefly about in the pandemic and how it exposed uh, uh, our inability to tackle many issues of ordinary violence uh, that actually worsened during the nationwide lockdowns. But on the other side, you know, we could also see how, you know, countries with female leadership were, you know, better equipped in uh, getting the situation of the pandemic under control. So to conclude, you know, I would say that the Indian government is making progress in terms of its uh, girl child education initiatives or even if we say, you know, we look at training and employment initiatives taken up by the government, you could refer to, you know, examples of, you know, women's participation and Skill India initiatives, uh, the STEP, Mahila, Ihat, or you could also look at you know very you know a very microscopic or uh, uh, microscopic angle of you know seeing how a massive project like the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan uh, has been addressing you know the problem of toilet insecurity. Again, something that is not discussed much, but you know toilet insecurity in rural parts of India is actually a very important security issue that you know women have faced for a very long time. So there are projects that are happening. Uh, of course, you know, what we need to look at it is, you know, how we could integrate these, you know, projects happening uh, separately and, uh, you know, try to kind of call out the policy outcomes from these projects and schemes and see how we could, you know, incorporate these together uh, in a gendered approach or a gendered policy uh, for security. Also, you know, with the, the ongoing 2030 development agenda of uh, the UN on the sustainable development goals, uh, the Niti Aayog of India is also working closely with civil society groups in achieving targets set under SDG 5, which is uh, gender equality. So issues of caste and gender, economic discrimination and accessibility are slowly being addressed through various projects. Uh, but again, you know, like I mentioned earlier, and I reiterate again that we need to, you know, uh, if we have to really consider a security policy standpoint, we need a solid plan to formally incorporate an uh, equitable gender representation. And I believe, I, I seriously believe that we are on the road to uh, achieve that in the decades to come. So uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think with that answer, we can wrap up the discussion. And I think it was a really interesting conversation that we had, and it definitely made me think a lot more on this subject. And I will definitely be going back to look more into it. And I would also like to mention that uh, I think the Irga platform is a really good platform to have conversations of this sort, where we bring in people from different fields with different voices and different experiences of their own, and we bring them together. and inculcate their experiences on this platform and i think that's a really good way to have such conversations and we should definitely have more conversations like this in the future so thank you so much for doing this with me thank you thank you shishti thank you once again for organizing this podcast and i absolutely agree that uh, we do need to have more such discussions and i'm sure we'll come across very interesting perspectives down the line thank you shishti thank you ma'am